Uh, my name is Stefka Dimitrova, and I'll talk about including voices and perspective that, uh, perspectives that often go unheard. And I will start with a brief, brief introduction of myself, and um, you will you, you, we'll learn more why I'm sharing about myself and uh, how that's related to the topic and to the presentation. So I'm currently uh, in uh, VMware's OSPO, our sponsors program office, being a program manager, working with communities, community strategy uh, team. And I've been in tech industry for about 10 years. Uh, I've had previously background in business and economics and had done different types of work. And I'm also passionate about um, outdoor climbing, outdoor education, uh, mountaineering. I'm a mountain guide that I do as a volunteer work as well. And I'm passionate about improvisational theater and playback theater. And you will also learn about it and how it relates to the topic. So in all of these different um, things that I do, I find inspiration from one area to bring into another area and to grow and to learn and to make, help me improve and help me also share that knowledge with others. Uh, because it's sometimes uh, when I'm stuck in one particular topic or problem in a certain area that I only can move forward when I found the solution somewhere else. And I hope you will be able to get some inspiration as well from other areas. And starting about talking about including unheard voices, and it also starts with a personal story, and that's why I shared a bit about myself as an introduction. And I'm not an expert in this, and I don't think uh, I'm the uh, 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 I'm like the the person who who have found all the solutions. But I'm on my way, and that's what I want, want to share it. And it all starts with uh, just sharing that in my first career, which was about 15 years ago, that's how I looked like at that point. Uh, I was the junior consultant in a financial company, being the only woman in the group, being the most junior, and uh, not really allowing myself to share any thoughts, experience, feedback. Uh, I I just kept silent. In, I mean, in team meetings, in uh, conversation, I thought I'm not experienced enough to, to speak up. I probably missed some of the information that others know, or I just am not worthy enough to speak in conferences. Not, uh, not possible. Share, uh, but just even share internal, internal messages. And then, Slowly, I was uh, being able to, to gain more confidence, to work hard, to work really hard, into being really um, acknowledged and to grow into my career. I moved into a technical job, tech industry as a consultant. And then uh, I did, and it was a German company, so besides being one of the few women in the room, uh, again, pretty junior, I was also the non-native speaker in the room, usually, uh, which added to my um, unwillingness to really share so much about myself and about my thoughts and my experience and my knowledge. And, uh, and I'm not sharing that to complain about being underprivileged, because I, I am in the privileged group in many other aspects, because I've never experienced really any um, racism or uh, I've not really been um, in a disadvantaged position in terms of nationality, culture, besides some biases about Eastern Europeans and Eastern European women sometimes. Uh, I also don't have any disadvantages, so I'm in a privileged group in many other aspects. But I wasn't really aware for a long time that uh, I was uh, I felt a uh, being not worthy enough, and that's what I didn't share so much about myself. It was not until I got into a management position, I need to be responsible for other people, that I realized I need to fight for them to, 
to be recognized, to, um, to allow space for them to speak, to, to share, to get feedback, to, to be taken seriously in their career. And I found my way at that time. My way was to work really hard, cost some burnouts, and, uh, and I thought that this is the normal way for uh, a professional woman to be recognized, to really need to prove much more than maybe my other colleagues needed. And, uh, and then sharing that, and this is a framework that I really like to go reading through uh, a paper and some articles. It's about different, um, uh, different layers of uh, like power and uh, less power. So Pamela Heiss describes this uh, cultural characteristic. So in some of the areas we might have more power, uh, for example, like being junior at work, we will be in the group of like having less power, then we'll grow into the career, and then we, have, we might go into the other way, or this is also called as the, besides power dynamics, it, it helps uh, recognize, understand the complexity of the identity. So just think about areas where you might be underprivileged, but then having other areas where you have more power. And, yeah, and just think about your own examples in different circumstances, depending on the different groups. Uh, and just, this is just one framework, of course. But what I want to share with that is that, uh, uh, regardless whether we are in the underprivileged or privileged group, we can do some things about it. Otherwise, uh, we all lose. So, in a way, if I don't share my feedback, and uh, I will feel that I don't really belong, and I've done that for a long time, that I don't really belong to that group, then I might be less motivated to do my work, which will lead to less creativity and less really um, flexibility and willingness and desire to, to complete my task and that I either cause some burnout or maybe uh, I will don't have good connections and relationships with my colleagues or my company will lose the added value that I could bring for that. And in the end, there are more partners, customers, other people, the wider community losing by uh, my lack of willingness to participate or to speak up and to share my feedback or my knowledge. And uh, this is related to costs. And I've just tried to find some research on how much does it cost? How much does the exclusion cost? And you can see here that there are um, estimated loss, loss from different research uh, and some of them are old, so I, I guess that then the amounts will be even higher. But they are really huge loss. And this is estimated, you see, 160 trillions, that's a, a loss in human capital wealth due to gender inequity. You see, uh, as a research for homophobia in India, and how much does it cost as a percentage of the GDP, or how could the GDP grow four to six percent in US, that's a huge growth that could be possible if the racial gap didn't exist, or um, if people in, with disabilities were included, uh, then we would avoid such a growth cost uh, in terms of loss in GDP. And yeah, I, saw, I told you that I have a financial background, so that's why I was really interested in finding real numbers about the costs associated with unheard voices. So it's not only me who will be suffering for that, it's not only my group of people and my company, but it, it will be the, a global loss. And yeah, and I, I shared just a little example, and I said I'm not really into most of all the unprivileged groups, but many others are. And so this is the purpose, this was the purpose and my idea when I started uh, to think about this talk is to recognize the blind spots, to recognize the blind spots that I have, to have some awareness about that, to share that with you, and also to motivate you to speak up or to be an ally for someone else, to provide space 
And uh, I will do that by providing some examples and hacks from other areas, as I already told you, uh, and that can be applied in our work with open source communities. And it's uh, and the inspiration is everywhere. And I found it uh, doing some uh, work as a hobby and an improvisational theater called playback theater. And I started it as a way to improve my presentation skills and be able to speak up here in front of public without shaking and losing my voice. And it ended up something that I really love and like doing. Uh, and playback theater is an improvisational form of theater where a group, uh, uh, so where there is the audience like you, and then performers as actors, musicians, and a facilitator, which would be we call conductor, the role. And audience share stories, uh, which will be played back by the actors on stage. And it starts with some small stories, small sharings, but then uh, the, uh, this helps the group get connected. And it's a work used a lot in social. And I've drawn here some similarities uh, in terms of uh, common principles and values, but I will share first a bit more about playback, and then I will come back to share the similarities with open source. And because it's art, and I wanted to present art in some more artistic way, which will be hard to be uh, like a solo performer. So I just combined some uh, videos of different groups, some of them that I know personally, so that I can give you a little bit of excerpt of what's playback theater, and then uh, that will be easier for, for me to explain what are the hacks or what are the tricks that I want to share taken from the playback theater as an example. So here is the video, and I hope we can hear it well. An experience where people from the audience share stories or moments, and then through the generosity of the performers, it's retold for the audience in a, a way that is really enjoyable. Do you hear the voice well, or we need it a bit louder? Yeah, it's okay. okay. It's just brilliant. I don't know how they get the energy for all those creative ideas. It was such fun. You have kind of like an idea of what they might do and they always do something bigger yeah. and better. It touched me on an emotional level and I think it's really good that we can see that coming out of theatre. I love that you never know what you're going to get. So it was a part of everything that I either experienced or felt or was reminded of. It was fantastic. It's a form of applied theater where actors, musicians, and dancers take stories from the audience and then on the spot play them back as literal interpretations, metaphor, or allegory using music and movement. Playback theater is improvised. That doesn't mean it's always funny. Our shows often flow smoothly between drama and comedy and even tragedy as our goal is to honor the teller and their story. We begin each performance by being a little vulnerable and by demonstrating what the audience is about to see. Hi, my name is Naya. Each player steps forward and reveals something about themselves and then the rest of the team plays it back. This helps set the tone for the program and lets the audience in on who we are. Then, we begin by asking our audience how they're doing with a few low stakes questions. Today? I started out feeling a little bit stressed. I'm uh, solo parenting this week, my husband. Right, so I felt a little bit better once I transitioned. <laughs> okay, so let's watch. And this is my playback company in Bulgaria. <laughs> We're built as human beings to communicate through stories. This is Jill Salas. It's She's one of the co-founders of Playback Theater. It's together. how we construct our sense of history. It's how we construct meaning. So Playback Theater is about stories. 
but not the stories of fictional heroes and heroines, not the stories of distant celebrities, but stories of yourselves, of ourselves, of neighbors, families, friends, strangers, ordinary people. Okay, so after each voice, after each one, we would play back what we heard in a short movement improvisational theater piece, one voice at a time. And after a little while, when we felt there was a, a connection, we would invite someone to come and sit over here with me, if I was the conductor, and tell a longer story. And after a while, we'd hear several of those stories and act them out. And after an hour or so, you, the audience, we, the performers, we would have co-created a kind of tapestry of stories. We were crazy enough to embark on something completely un unknown. This was in 1975, I don't know if I said that. That was a very fertile time for new ideas. We did keep going, and after not very long, people began to do this in other parts of the world, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, Asia, Europe, Eastern Europe, Africa, the Middle East, in theaters, schools, prisons, refugee camps, government departments. There are people with stories everywhere. So this kind of versatility can make it a little hard to categorize what can be the purpose of something so mercurial. And to me, the ultimate purpose really is about dialogue, a kind of non-cognitive, embodied dialogue that invokes creativity and imagination and builds dialogue, builds understanding, respect, connection, empathy, and change. The world needs dialogue, clearly, and we can offer what we know. We know how to make space for stories. We know how to create an atmosphere of authenticity and trust and safety. We know how to embody a story so that the teller knows that she's been heard. The audience knows what she has lived. Yes, so in a way, um, yeah, this was one of the co-founders. She and her husband founded that in um, yeah, 58 years ago, uh, 48 years ago. And, um, uh, and what they did is that they, they gave it for free to the world, like open source, <laughs> in a way. Uh, there is no franchising, because there are some regulations about uh, trainers and accreditation for trainers, but besides that, everyone can practice playback, and it's done in 70 countries now around the world. Um, and also, it's a community thing, so it, it requires community engagement. It's a collaborative event, you know, it doesn't, you, you heard, it doesn't happen if there is no collaboration between audience and the, in, and the artist. Uh, and it's improvisation, so there is a lot of uh, adaptation, transformation. Uh, also starts with honest, transparent sharing, and, um, and that invites for real human connection with spontaneity and creativity. And, uh, uh, and this is, these are the things that I've taken out from per playback theater and my, and my work there, my passion about there, and then I, I try applying it everywhere else, and in closing, and especially in open source community. So first, how to invite voices, how to invite people. So first is creating a safe space and in playback theater, you've heard a bit about it, but there are, cert there are certain rituals, and they are designed to create a container where people would feel safe enough to share, to be vulnerable, to be themselves. Uh, there's a code of ethics, a code of conduct, and we do that in open source. So whenever I share about playback theater, feel free to relate to your work and take some examples. And it's not always possible to have safe space. And you'd probably just think of examples where there is a really hard conflict and some people feel hurt or not welcomed or not really safe enough. So then we aim at creating a soft space. And I like this term in terms of, okay, that's a space where it's not completely safe for, from falling down 
and uh, hurting, but it won't be uh, but it will be soft if you fall down, so it won't hurt much. You, you have a mechanism to heal, to protect, to provide help, even if uh, it wasn't so safe. Uh, and and I, I try to relate to that, and especially when playback theater is done and, and is hurt in prisons. It, it's done in... Um, uh, and I, I've worked also with refugees, and it's really hard to, to really allow everything to show up there, but it's worth doing it. Show vulnerability, and uh, this is on one hand done by the introductions of the uh, actors at the beginning, but it's something that we can always do when we want to approach people to show vulnerability and share with some honest uh, sharing, and, and then just, just think of when I started this presentation, I shared about myself and my personal experience. And you don't have to tell me, but you just think of whether you trusted me more after I shared that or less, or how do you felt about it. Uh, so this vulnerability is essential for developing the trust and building the safe space. And in this way, we lead by example. We, uh, we can support only when we are also allowing ourselves to be vulnerable and show up and allow ourselves to make mistakes at some points. Sociometry is used a lot in playback theater. This is, uh, this is a, a method that's uh, been developed for, from the founder of psychodrama, Moreno, and uh, it's used to, to discover and to describe the uh, the existing relationships, the social status between so the, the, the people, the structures that exist. So it can be as simple as uh, asking some questions like who in the audience comes from, uh, from Spain or who comes from different regions. Then it can be also developed in a way to recognize what are the existing relationship with the people. And this helps to, um, to extend the to come from the unconscious to the conscious, because there are some unconscious uh, biases or conscious uh, thoughts or feelings of being accepted or rejected in a group, and with this sociometry, we help them show up, and then it's much more easier for someone to, to approach and say, ah, I see you're friends and you know each other from working together previously, maybe I can now sh ask something and uh, I can be in that group as well. Uh, because whenever people gather, they make choices, and as I said, they might be conscious or unconscious, but we always make choices whether we like or dislike the people, whether we trust them or don't trust them. And making some of this more conscious will help us building that trust. Provide opportunities for dialogue, conversations in small groups. So one, one thing that I really like when I get to do that in the performances is to invite the audience to, to share something. Uh, so they have five minutes to find someone in the audience that they probably didn't know before, which would be the, the best to find someone that they really want to get introduced uh, to and get to know each other but it could be also just sharing to the person next to you. And this helps, uh, again, uh, invite people who might never feel safe enough to speak up in the larger audience, but they could share at least something personal to the person sitting next to them. And uh, I've applied that in uh, meetups, doing breakout rooms, having uh, different, uh, providing different opportunities to really speak with people in smaller groups, for people to, to come together and to share in smaller groups before they are ready to really share in a lar larger audience. And this all needs training, uh, so training to be, to listen actively, to listen empathetically, and my dogs doesn't listen actively or empathetically right now, maybe actively, because I was just mad about them running in the rain, but, <laughs> but I'm uh, having a picture of them, because I said training, because there's this constant um, uh, trying and maybe doing some mistakes 
and maybe stepping on some shit. And this is a props here. This was an exercise uh, to uh, to help people not. Yeah, to help your group not step on your own shit, <laughs> but sometimes it happens. Uh, and whenever it happens, it's recognize it early enough and try try your best next time and train to be uh, to be better and listening and understanding and inviting others and use your creativity and imagination and art in that and art in this way. I mean also. Um, really providing an opportunity to not be only in our conscious brains but also get to that get connected with on an unconscious level and so there will be uh, an ideal scenario where if uh, i go and talk to you all or talk to someone new that uh, or new colleague in in my a company, then I'll be happier and feel more motivated to work, uh, have more creativity, which will be, be a greater benefit for everyone around me, not just just me, and my family as well, not my colleagues as well. More happy faces around, and uh, a happier and inclusive, uh, more inclusive world. And. It, it, this sounds ideally, but it's really just the small steps that we can do uh, on one hand as, uh, as allies or as uh, people of privilege in certain cases, but also being also uh, aware of some situations or areas where we'll be uh, the underprivileged and we wouldn't think that our opinion matters. To think about that, it does matter. So to wrap it up, some of the learnings from the playback theater that I'm, I'm applying and I'm trying to really consciously do uh, on a daily basis in my work is uh, creating that safe space or at least soft space. Something I didn't mention, but it's really key for um, improvisation theater is saying yes and. And this doesn't mean that I will be um, um, that I will agree with everything that my colleagues will say, but I will allow a, a, a space for that. So in improvisation, it's whenever the colleague is offering something, uh, you don't say, no, that's a stupid thing, you add to it. So in a way, just allow that space, okay, maybe I don't agree with that, but let it just, let, let, let not react to that, let just have no biases to that and just allow it to be and then add my opinion to top of it, but not necessarily as a conflict. Uh, show vulnerability, be honest and share. I already said about using sociometry to relate and to build this empathetic uh, state. It's also provide opportunities for dialogue and sharing in smaller groups. That's also something that uh, um, that I think we can all think of ways to to find such opportunities and uh, yeah, just just uh, think of areas where I said where you wouldn't speak up in a larger audience, but we might find a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone and invite that person or, or uh, yeah, approach them. And use art, imagination, and creativity to connect on a deeper level. And of course, that's not always easy. <laughs> Giving day-to-day -day job that's uh, that's really focused on uh, providing outcomes and results. But we can all be creative about it, and then uh, have really have some other activities and I shared my way. My way is by doing different things that inspire me in each of the other area. But you can have your own way to, to really um, train. Yeah, it's this, and a, a train all these um, mm, all these methods and also uh, in this way yeah, not only being active and empathetic when listening but also have uh, uh, have a way to reach to your deeper resources and we all have these deeper resources that we, we, we can apply when we have the inspiration, we have the encouragement to, do, to deliver our best. 
So why not we start it right now? <laughs> and uh, this is just an invitation to uh, that there is never a best moment to plant a tree, so it, it was the best moment, it was like 30 years ago, but the next best moment is just right now. So the, the same is, uh, uh, yeah, I shared some of my learnings and I've definitely uh, find my ways back then. I would do that I'm different right now, but I couldn't change anything and I don't really need to. I have my learnings and now I can find my better approach and by sharing you these thoughts and these learnings, I hope to, to allow you also that uh, uh, safe space and imagination and creativity to to find your way to include voices and perspectives and share your voices and perspectives. And I'm thanking you for using that because I've been to so many great presentations these days and I am eager to listen to more people and to talk with more people on these events and that's, I'm really happy that this is uh, uh, such an opportunity. And this is the, yeah, for me also, that's why I choose that as a really good venue to show you and tell you about my passion. And I invite for any questions that you might have <laughs> in regard or sharing. Uh, well, <laughs> yeah, there is a hand. <laughs> Ivana. My dogs? Yeah, that's my read picture. Ah, no, this was props. That was props on the floor. You mean this picture? No, no, no. It was just for an. They're plastic. <laughs> no, that was plastic. <laughs> yeah, I will find it somewhere. But yeah. Uh -oh. Okay, here. Well, but really looked real. So I was really um, making my best to not step on it. <laughs> Yeah, question. You mean after a performance? What's uh, or for me? Yeah, for in my work. Yeah, uh, yeah, I can. Yeah, yeah, I just realized that there is no micro. So the question was after, uh, after I've started doing playback theater, what was the benefit and how it influenced my work? Uh, so um, on one hand, it's uh, yeah, having to trust myself more. It's because working as an actor or conductor, I'm mostly a conductor, which is the facilitation role. It's, it involves a lot of active listening, a lot of decision making on the spot, uh, and uh, trusting my intuition. Because in many cases, uh, people share, uh, and I need to recognize the emotion, because what, what with an actor or the group playback, we will play back the emotion of what they're sharing. It's because we all heard that, uh, like the example on the video was like a, a person stressed out of being a solo parenting for a week. But then uh, what she really wants to tell in some cases might be, I need support, I need understanding, I need, I need someone to take care of me. In other cases, it would be something else and just listening for that message. And then I can apply that at work, at, in my personal life, everywhere, to really listen for the emotion of what the people are really telling me by telling me that story. And that helps me a lot. Uh, and after a performance, usually what happens is that the audience stays together and wants to talk for half an hour or an hour later. So you, and this is so inspirational that you have a group of complete strangers that after an hour of a performance or hour and a half, they can chat as close friends. So if that's possible in this setting, then it's possible in all the other settings. And I'm much more optimistic about people and humanity and our world <laughs> because of that. So that's, that helps me being more motivated. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Anything? So 
thanks for joining and thanks to appreciate your time and happy to talk with you after that. <laughs> Thank you.